Welcome everyone to another uh, mini course at Physics Latin. Today we are very happy to have uh, once again uh, Johanna Knapp to take uh, to talk about the physics physical mathematics of cage linear sigma models. Johanna is a theoretical physicist specializing in string theory. She obtained her PhD from TU Vienna in two thousand and seven. Uh, focusing on related topics uh, of Calabi-Yau manifolds, mirror symmetry, and their application to string theory. Her research explored the interplay between geometry and physics, particularly the role of higher dimensional spaces in string theory, the study of compactifications, and the topic of today, uh, gauge linear sigma models. NAC has held academic positions at renowned institutions, and currently she's faculty member at the University of Melbourne. Uh, please remember to raise your hand at any point if you have any question, and I will leave you with Johanna. Please go ahead. Well, thanks again for inviting me to come back to this wonderful seminar series, and I apologize for it being early for the Chinese participants and late for the Latin American participants. Uh, but yeah, time zones are complicated. Um, all right, um, so before I start, uh, I think I should um, start with an apology um, for the fact that these lectures is actually the second time I give these lectures. Uh, and the first time was a few months ago at a summer school at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, um, which was sort of a meeting point between mathematicians and physicists. I only had four hours of lectures here, and this will be six hours of lectures, but I noticed there that I had to skip a lot of material um, so I didn't really extend those lectures, but I hope to take more time, and that should also mean that uh, you're always welcome to ask questions. Um, so it's it's very difficult for me to gauge um, which audience I'm having here, and if I'm talking more to mathematicians and physicists, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a bridge about this and uh, try to use terminology uh, on both sides. Um, so if you're here and if you could just briefly type one word in the chat if your background is more mathematics or more physics or both that would be really really helpful for me to see um who i'm talking to so if you just type math or physics or both um that would be really nice to see okay <laughs> so i'm just waiting for a few seconds so i see a lot of physicists coming in which is nice uh nice to see um so while I'm seeing a lot of physics here, so it's called the physical mathematics of the gauge linear sigma model because uh, a lot of output that comes out of these physical theories is actually digested and uh, by mathematics. So even though you're a physicist, uh, you, if you're working on this subject area, you will see very commonly that you have to talk about talk the language of mathematicians to make yourselves heard and understood. Um, so I saw in the schedule that uh, soon you will also have a lecture series by a mathematician Rachel Webb, um, who's um, who will talk about very related things, and I will try to introduce some terminology that you may also hear again um, in in during her lectures. Um, all right, so I don't know. I'm closing this here. So now I have to share my screen again, I think. All right, so thanks for that. So let's get started. Here we go again. Okay, um, so I want to start. Uh, yeah, one, one other thing I should say is that I have some lecture notes uh, for this, and I will send them to Daniel, and he will probably put them on the website. Uh, so in particular, if you cannot read my ugly handwriting, there will also be a PDF shared with you. All right, otherwise, if you can't read something, just uh, shout out. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to give you a brief outline um, and then start off um, with some slight overview of what I'm going to talk about, and then we'll go right into business. So the outline of this lecture will be, well, not surprisingly, it, it's about gauge linear sigma models, which now once and for all, I will abbreviate as GLSMs. And the first part will be under quotation marks, a definition, not in the rigorous mathematical sense, but leaning towards what mathematicians see as GLSMs, because it's also very practical and it saves me from 
um, writing huge actions with lots of indices. And an important notion I will say more about, which is called phases of GLSMs. Uh, next, I will talk about, so this will probably um, take the whole two hours today. Sorry, there's like a poll popping up and uh, I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, I've been teaching on Zoom for two years, so we'll, we'll manage. All right. Um, and um, then I will talk about something called the Coulomb branch. which contains quantum information about gauge linear sigma models. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll be there when we get there. Um, and then I want to talk um, basically open strings uh, or gauge linear sigma models associated to open string theory, which will lead us to the introduction of D-brains in GLSMs. And the mathematics we're going to connect to is what we want to ask ourselves is, how to move deep brains inside a moduli space um, that I'm uh, that I will have to define as well, and that goes under the name deep brain transport, or in a more mathematical language, categorical equivalences. So you don't need to have any background on category theory um, to to listen to that. Um, and then I will talk about uh, very recent developments, which have given us a lot of new tools um, to compute interesting things with gauge linear sigma models. And these are supersymmetric localizations and partition functions. So this is the fact that you can actually, in certain circumstances, compute the path integral uh, of the GLSM exactly. Um, and get interesting results. Interesting, hopefully both for physics and mathematics. All right, um, so this is the outline. So today it will be definition and phases. Um, in the second lecture, I want to talk about the Coulomb branch and deep brains in more general. And in the third lectures, we're going to go to, to the advanced topics about of deep brain transport and partition functions. So that's the rough outline. And of course, it can be modified along the way. All right, um, the next thing I want to do before I really start is I want to give uh, an overview of the most important messages that I hope we're going to learn. And I also hope, uh, and I should give um, a disclaimer because I'm actually going to view at certain classes of GLSMs from a very biased angle. Um, and I just want to make clear that the story I'm telling is a very biased viewpoint and not certainly not all um, that is to be said about gauge linear sigma models. So the first thing I want to say is that at least for the sake of this talk, a GLSM is a two-dimensional quantum field theory. So it's a quantum field theory like string theory. It's a quantum field theory on a world sheet, uh, a Riemann surface. So all our fields will be dependent on the world sheet coordinates. Um, and it is a supersymmetric uh, quantum field theory. So I actually should say gauge theory. With a lot of supersymmetry. So we, we are in two dimensions. So we have a Riemann surface and one can, as you learn in string theory courses, you can nat naturally associate them with uh, parameterize the Riemann surface in terms of complex numbers. Um, and there is a holomorphic or anti-holomorphic sector, which translates into left and right moving degrees of freedom. And there's also a lot of supersymmetry, namely two supersymmetries in the left moving sector and two supersymmetry in the right moving sector. So this is non-minimal supersymmetry. Um, and the qualification I need to make here is um, that there are GLSMs also in higher dimensions like 3D, which are quite different, and I will not really talk about them. And there are also GLSM which have less supersymmetry. Uh, one case is when you add D brains uh, and you get 1,1 supersymmetry. This is what we're going to do later. 
but there is also um, a gauge linear sigma model associated to the heterotic string, which would give us 0, 0,2 supersymmetry. And I'm not an expert on that, so I will also not mention that. So for the sake of this lectures, it will be a 2D quantum field theory with 2,2 .2 supersymmetry, potentially broken by the presence of boundaries. But there's certainly more to it. So another specialization I'm going to make uh, is um, that one purpose of the GLSM is that you can use the GLSM to study string compactifications so that's a true statement but in particular on Calabi-Yau manifolds um, so you don't really need to know a lot of the algebraic geometry of Calabi-Yau's uh, in the context of this uh, lecture series. Um, but the, the basic picture will be of a standard string compactification that we have 4D, and then we have like six extra dimensions with some complicated compact manifold, and that will be the Calabi-Yau. And they are kind of special uh, string backgrounds. Uh, in the context of string theory, and we will use this supersymmetric gauge theory to study Calabi-Yau manifolds and the moduli spaces. And here I should also say that the GLSM itself is uh, more general than that, so you can also associate GLSMs to non-Calabi-Yau's, and I will the physics will actually be very different compared to the physics of Calabi-Yau GLSMs, and I will focus on the Calabi-Yau's, um, but along the way I want to make um, comments, uh, additional comments uh, on the non-Calabi-Yau case as well, because that might also be interesting for some people. Um, and um, in the Calabi-Yau case in particular, um, there is relations to conformal field theory. I will not mention a lot of this, um, but uh, I will maybe sometimes use some ter terminology there. And um, another important notion is that um, this Calabi-Yau's uh, or also other things um, emerge as the low energy configurations uh, of gauge linear sigma models. So something that we will discuss today is um, that we have a parameter space that I need to define. So depending on the locus in the GLSM parameter space to be specified, Um, we get different uh, low energy effective theories. So most of what we're going to do today will actually be take a physical theory and analyze the classical vacua and see what we get out of them. So if you have a quantum field theory background and if you know how to uh, compute the low energy effective theories. Um, this is basically what we're going to do. All right. Um, and then, um, and what we will actually see, and this is called phases of the GLSM, that basically means that we have um, different low energy effective theories. So depending on where we are in the moduli space, you have a different physics. And that's not something unusual if you think about QCD. QCD is a confining phase and it has an asymptotically free phase. And basically this is what we're going to do as well. But instead of uh, realistic physics, we will get rather advanced mathematics out of this. And um, so there is a correspondence between phases. 
And this is like a duality. So you realize that you look at what at the parent theory, and then you have different um, low energy effective theories, and they are not they have like different features, but they are not entirely different. And in particular, there are some protected quantities that are in some sense equivalent. So a lot of um, the GLSM physics will actually be about studying these equivalences and also studying the mathematics behind that. All right, uh, and then finally, so adding uh, D brains. So that just means boundary conditions. So our, our space time can have a boundary, our 2D Riemann surface um, in the boundaries. Uh, promotes this uh, correspondences to categorical equivalences. This is also where the mathematics come in. So a lot of dualities that appear in string theory um, actually are can be phrased in terms of equivalences of categories. And I want to give a little bit of a flavor how this comes out of the physics discussion. Um, and then finally, um, uh, this GLSM partition functions will make it possible for us to compute uh, certain quantum corrections in string compactifications. But I will say more about this when I get there. So yeah, as I said, uh, I'll just check in the chat if there are any questions, interrupt me um, at any time. And uh, after this sort of overview of the plan, let me now go to the start and give you a sort of a definition of a gauge linear signal model and discuss in examples and in more detail what the phases of the gauge linear signal model are. So this is more or less, I don't have a really consistent labeling uh, but I will just uh, call this GLSM definition and phases. So uh, since I'm talking to a significant number of people with a physics background, um, let me first say that in contrast to certain other theories that are very popular, GLSMs uh, actually have actions that you can write down. So Uh, actions. So what you can do is you can write down an action and you integrate um, over our world sheet. I'll introduce some more notation right now. So sigma is our two-dimensional space-time and I will call this the world sheet. I will assume that I have done some kind of Vick rotation that we have uh, uh, where the world sheet is a Euclidean space. So pretty much like in the Polyakov action. Um, so which is a Riemann surface. And I will just put complex coordinates on that. We'll call them set and set bar. So these are the world sheet coordinates and the GLSM is a two dimensional quantum field theory on this world sheet. And then I could, but will not write down a big Lagrangian density. Um, and if you, and I should also say, this is, the GLSM has been around for a while. And if you want to see the details worked out perfectly, um, you, I'm referring to Witten's original paper from 1993. In the lecture notes, there will be the precise references. So since there is a lot of supersymmetry, uh, there is also a lot of field content um, and the action is uh, half a page long and I don't want to spend time writing it down. But let me give you the field content, at least schematically. So at first, we will have two types of scalar fields. Um, there can be more than one, but I'm suppressing indices. So these are the scalar fields. And they will be the main contenders in our discussion. And then because of supersymmetry, you also have um, a number of fermions, well, actually with 2,2 two supersymmetry superpartners uh, to each of the scale, two superpartners for each scalar. Um, so we will not see much of those. Um, so I'll just say fermions. Um, and then because it's a supersymmetric gauge theory, um, we will have a vector field.
So we are in two dimensions, so it has two components. And then if we want, if you look at the off-shell formulation of this, we also will have a bunch of auxiliary fields that come in uh, in the super multiplet. And you can write that down differently for a class of gauge linear sigma models. And for those people who know supersymmetry, uh, let me just say that if I, I can group them into certain super multiplets, so in particular, if I take phi and the psi uh, and f, this will be a chiral multiplet. And if I take sigma, lambda, the lambdas v and d, uh, this will be a vector multiplet. Um, but I really don't want to talk about supersymmetry because uh, actually we will not need this because, as I said before, we will mostly be interested in the classical ground states from now on and in lower energy effective theory. And we will actually see that most of this is going to be governed by the scalar fields. Uh, and that's why I'm not going to introduce more details either on supersymmetry or on the scalar fields. And I will just mention that in the background, supersymmetry is actually happening and certain structures that appear are due to the supersymmetry. All right. Um, so um, instead of writing down the action explicitly, I now I'm choosing to give more of a definition that is a little bit closer to what mathematicians are doing. Uh, even though I should say that the mathematics definitions that you find in the literature um, are not really precisely what I'm doing. But I will just define, under quotation marks, the GLSM using the following data. And I really want to emphasize that compared to the action and the Lagrangian and all the supersymmetry, this is only a part of the GLSM from a physics perspective, but it will be enough for our purposes. So the data that I'm going to look at is um, four things that I need to specify. So the first thing is G, which is the gauge group. So we have a gauge, uh, we have a gauge theory, so we will need a and I will define this as a compact Lie group. And this is the gauge group. So think U1, think U2, think SU2, something like this. Um, usually not something more exotic and certainly not for the sake of these lectures. So the next thing I need to define or I want to define is V. And there you really can see the simplification that I'm doing by just focusing on this data. So V is just some complex vector space. So what is that? Um, it's basically the space that our chiral scalars phi are taking values in. So I'll say with coordinates phi i. Uh, so these are the scalars. But some of the matter field, I'll say scalars of the chiral multiplet. And this is sort of the first point uh, where one should protest because we're working in the field theory. So, um, and we know that scalar fields, they are just not complex numbers because they depend on our space time. So actually what would be more precise is to say that um, the phi i's, depending on how many we have, are actually phi i's that in this case holomorphically um, depend on the world sheet coordinates. So the phi i's are maps from the world sheet into V and they are holomorphic. And the holomorphicity basically comes from the fact that they stem from a chiral multiplet um, in the supersymmetric theories. 
But if you look at the definitions uh, in, in mathematics, they're just like complex numbers. So you can suppress the world tree dependence and we will also be able to do that uh, for, most, uh, for most of the discussion. All right. Um, the next piece of data is this row V um, and that's a representation. So the row V is also called the matter representation and it's a map from our gauge group into, if you're mathematically inclined, the general linear transformations uh, acting on V. Uh, so this is the matter representation. And it just says uh, that our gauge group will act on the matter fields. The only matter fields are specified so far are the scalars. So that means that the scalars transform in a certain way under the gauge symmetry, and that's uh, encoded uh, in terms of, by the data given by these representations. In particular, if you know representation theory of, of, of Lie groups and Lie algebras, you know that the representations are characterized by weights. Um, and the weights in physics basically translate into the gauge charges, and that will be an important piece of data uh, that we will need for later on. So I will just write in the mathematics side the weights of rho v, and I will give introduce a notation. I will denote them by capital Q, and they will have two indices. And if you are very precise, they will take values in this beast here, T star C, which is um, the dual of the Lie algebra. Um, tau of a maximally commuting subgroup or a maximal torus T in your gauge group. So if your gauge group is non-abelian like um, U2 for instance there will be a maximally commuting subgroup U1 squared um, and the weights are actually taking values in this. So the indices here is um, I goes from one to the dimension of the complex vector space. So this is basically the number of, this is given by the number of chiral scalar fields we have. And um, the A goes from one um, to the rank of the gauge group. So U1 would have rank one, and then I can drop the A index. Um, and this defines the gauge charges. So, um, for instance, if we just looked at, at the GLSM, which is like 2D electrodynamics, which is not really dynamics because there is no, pra no propagating photon, but let's take GSU1, which has rank one. I can drop the indices, uh, um, the index A in the Qs, uh, and then I would just have some f scalar fields, phi i, and they transform as e to the i some gauge parameter. And because it's a gauge symmetry, it will depend locally on the world sheets. And then I have this qi by i. So you want symmetry is just a phase rotation and the gauge charges of the fields are given by the weights of the representation that are actually, that is specified by these qi's. Um, and uh, so for now, um, this gives a huge class of theories. So you can specify any complicated gauge group you like, like you want to the 27 times SU2 times U3. Um, and you can put as many complex scalar fields uh, or chiral multiplets in there as you like. Uh, I'll say more about the vector multiples in a second. And you can decide which charges your fields have under the symmetry, and then you can compute a huge number of GLSMs. So for our purposes, or for the, the purposes of these lectures, I want to be a little bit more specific uh, in what is allowed, uh, even though you don't really have to do this. So what I will impose here, and I will say that this is optional, uh, so you don't need to do it, uh, but I will do it, and I will keep doing it throughout the lectures, is that I will impose something that I will call the Calabi-Yau condition.
So at this point, it is absolutely not obvious why I should call a condition Calabiao condition um, in the way I stated. And the statement is that uh, the represent the matter representation I just introduced is uh, not um, the most general one, but I make a restriction. So I say that G, instead of mapping into general linear transformations, it will just map into special linear transformations acting on uh, the vector space our fields take values in. Uh, and basically, this amounts to imposing um, a tracelessness condition on the weights. So it means that the weights have to add up to zero. For every um, for every charge associated to a U1 subfactor of the gauge group. Um, and we will see later on uh, that this is really useful for Calaviaus. Um, from the physics perspective, um, this is actually uh, this is actually an anomaly cancellation condition. And that's why also a bit difficult to see because anomalies are usually very hard to like be extracted from quantum field theory. Uh, but I just want to mention the background. Uh, for so what's anomalous? Um, so let's write for the axial U1 symmetry. So I don't want to go into too much detail here, but uh, this is one of the one of the reasons where, or one of the instances we see that supersymmetry plays an important role. So uh, our theories will have enhanced supersymmetry, so n equals two in the left and the right moving sector. And when you have this type of symmetries, uh, the symmetry algebra will tell you that you have additional symmetries that you get for free. And in the context of 2,2 supersymmetries, these are U1 symmetries. So you have a U1 symmetry in the left moving sector, and you have a U1 symmetry in the right moving sector, and they are called R symmetries. Um, so you can take, because you have two independent ones, you can combine them into what's called the vector and the axial U1 R symmetry. And these symmetries can be anomalous at the quantum, meaning that they are no longer uh, exact symmetries at the quantum level unless you impose certain conditions. And, um, and, and this uh, Calabiao condition basically is uh, traced back to the fact that one of these uh, U1R symmetries is anomalous unless you impose this condition. And you can work with these theories without imposing this, um, but the physics will change rather drastically. So from now on, I will, I will always, un unless stated otherwise, I will always assume that this condition is satisfied. All right, so speaking of our symmetries, um, there is a fourth piece of data that I haven't specified yet, and that is actually the other type of R symmetries. So remember with 2,2 symmetries, uh, we have two independent R symmetries. Um, one I call the axial, and the other I call the vector R symmetry. And the vector R symmetry will also play an important role. So important enough that I put it as part of the data. So um, we have this extra global symmetry, which I call vector U1. And that also acts somehow on our matter field. So this is the um, representation Uh, of the, and here I should say that we have gauge symmetries and global symmetries. And this is a global symmetry, vector R symmetry. Um, and the weights, so weights of representations uh, always are like charges in physics, and we'll call them Ri. So that, for instance, means, and that's always a U1. So um, if I had n equals 4 supersymmetry, it would be an SU2, for instance. But uh, since I have n equals 2 supersymmetry, I have U1. So that means that the phi i's, or fields we had before, transform with some parameter beta, which is a constant now, um, and the corresponding R charges. So this is now constant. So not a gauge symmetry. All right, so um, if I specify these four pieces of data, 
in principle, I have a full gauge linear sigma model, and everything I can choose here, Calabia or not, will give me a GLSN. So in addition to that, or from this data, we can add, we can deduce some more information that you don't need to specify because it will come along the right. So um, one of the things um, that we have in when we write down the action, for instance, is that we have three parameters. And um, so these are coupling constants. Or parameters or moduli, if you like. Cannot spell moduli. All right. Um, so in the context, so these are just you know coupling parameters for interaction terms uh, in the action that I haven't written down. And in particular, I want to highlight two classes, um, which are called the Fi of Faye Iliopoulos parameter. And an angular variable, which is typically called the theta angle. Many, many theories with matter have, uh, have these properties. Um, and you get them for free because it's basically specified um, um, it, it, it's basically um, specified by your choice of gauge group um, and so on. You can you get these additional parameters in your specification of a theory. So in particular, these Xi A's, they are uh, real parameters. And they are, the A index uh, already signifies that uh, in my notation. In principle, there are as many as you have ranks of the gauge group. So for a U1 symmetry, you have one of them. For a U1 squared symmetry, you have two of them, and so on and so forth. However, there is a bit of a, a subtlety um, in, uh, in, in non-abelian gauge symmetries that I will not be able to fully cover or give justice. So I'll just be a bit sloppy here and write a less or equal to say that there, at least, there are no more than uh, rank G Fi parameters. Uh, and the same holds for the theta angles. And the theta angle is called a theta angle uh, because it's actually, it is two pi periodic. And that also comes out of the physics uh, that I will not specify, but um, this will be, for instance, specified in Witten's original paper. And also here, in principle, you can have as many, in the abelian case, you will have as many as the rank of the gauge group. Um, but in the non-abelian case, um, you can have less than those. So these are the Fi parameters. And these are the theta angles. Um, and what we will see and what will become very important uh, in sort of the angle I, or the view I want to take on GLSMs is that wh whatever you do with the GLSM, you will find that they combine into complex parameters. So you have two real parameters, one of them periodic, uh, but they actually always combine into a complex parameter. Or into complex parameters. And I will call them, so this is a T in my handwriting, and it's different to this other T, which I denoted like that for the maximally commuting subgroup uh, of your gauge group. So these are two different things. So they are just CI minus I. Theta A. And they take value in the dual of the complexified Lie algebra of um, the gauge group. So this is the Lie algebra. Of G. Um, and to be more precise, because I have this like less or equal rank G in there. Um, you were more rigorous than I will be during these lectures. The T's actually take values in the Lie algebra, in the complex, in the dual of the complexified Lie algebra. And now I need to use the other T of the maximal torus modded out 
by 2 pi i p, which is the weight lattice. And there is an equivariance condition with the vial group. And if you work that out, for instance, for U2, you will see that even though there, U2 has rank two, um, because there is a vial symmetry that um, you have to mod out by, um, you only have one FI parameter, but I will, I'm not sure if I will make it until there. So the main point is now, and you will have to bear with me uh, for quite some more time to actually see this, that in the case of Calabi-Yau geosms, um, this will map, the, the parameter space of the GLSM will map to a certain part of the moduli space of the corresponding calabi that we will somehow have to extract out of this GLSM. So this will connect to the Kela, or so which are the volume moduli of the calabi -Yau. So the point I want to make in part today is um, that um, through the GLSM, we can get access uh, to a Calabiao in a certain way, um, which is hopefully somewhat interesting for string compactification, but not only the Calabiao itself, but a whole moduli space attached to it. And in string compactifications, it's always it's, it's, it's often the case that the moduli spaces encode quantum information uh, and, and quantum corrections like instanton corrections of the theory. So having also access to the moduli space gives us also access to sort of the, the quantum world of string compactifications. And this is also what I want to advertise in these lectures. All right, um, so we cannot see this now, but this is a for later reference. So another thing you can do um, if you have this specified this data, and this is also optional, but I will do it in all the examples that we have, is that we can add further interaction terms in the in the form of the superpotential. So you can choose a holomorphic superpotential. And it will be a function of the scalar fields after you've broken everything down. And if you're a mathematician, then I've been told that I should write that this takes values in the symmetric algebra of the dual of the vector space to the space of fields. Um, that's apparently what makes mathematicians happy. For me, it's just a polynomial in the fields, which um, satisfy additional conditions because we have a gauge theory. So such that we have a gauge invariance conditions, of course, because otherwise adding a superpotential to the action will not make much sense. So it's gauge invariant. So that means if we take W of our fields, I, I tend to suppress the indices um, and we take so now I'm calling this little g, even though I'm using the letter for the Lie algebra, but in this case, it's just a group element acting on the fields with the corresponding weights uh, satisfied by the row V. We want phi to be invariant. And then another perk of supersymmetry is that the action that I am consistently not writing down is only supersymmetric if W has a definite R charge. So this is again the supersymmetry lurking in the background that the vector R charge that we have specified by this uh, part of data R uh, that I've given before um, is two. So that means that if we have W and we have a U1 to the R action, so the, these are really the weights. So lambda is in U1 V, um, then this is not invariant, but it transforms with weight two uh, like this. 
And uh, you don't need to add a superpotential to your GLSM, but if you're interested in particular in compact calabiaus, which we want to be in the context of string theory, um, then uh, you want to have a superpotential because as we will see, that will make sure um, that we get something like calabiao hypersurfaces. All right, um, so um, this is this is the way I want to see a GLSM at this point. So instead of writing down long actions and a lot of supersymmetry transformations, I will only focus for now on the scalar fields um, and I will specify them by this uh, data. And uh, the last thing I want to put in there is going to be relevant in the next lecture when we talk about the Coulomb branch. So far, I've only talked about the phi's, uh, which are the scalar, the chiral scalar fields. But because we have a gauge symmetry, uh, we also have a vector multiplet. So there is another type of scalars that appear in the vector multiplets. And these are the sigmas that I have had before. So once you've specified this data um, you're, uh, with the gauge group and everything, you also have these additional scalar fields that take values in the their complex as well, and they take values in the complexified Lie algebra uh, of um, the gauge group. And in the physics terminology, these are the scalars of the vector multiplet. And uh, they are not holomorphic. So if I write down, so two things. Um, at first, I can, they are Lie algebra valued. So I can write them as sigma is sigma a t a, where these are the generators of the Lie algebra. So they will typically be matrix valued um, because they are from the vector multiplet. So this transforms into a joint representation. Um, and they are not holomorphic. So if I, for once, explicitly exhibit the world sheet dependence, which I tend to suppress, they will depend both on the right and left moving um, world sheet coordinates. All right, um, so that's basically it for the data. We have a gauge symmetry. We have two types of matter fields or like scalar fields, namely the Phi fields and the sigma fields. We have the corresponding, we have um, a representation that tells us how they transform under the gauge symmetry, uh, which is the matter representation. And because we have supersymmetry, we also have this R symmetry. And um, we know how to, we specify how the fields transform under R symmetry. So um, this is all we have. So I. I'm just checking the chat and I'm mostly seeing that there are lots of international people there. So fantastic. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please ask, um, because I will go on now and talk about what a phase of the GLSM is. So right now we have done the most basic thing you can do with the physical theory. Um, you have given the field content and the symmetries. And in principle, I could write down a classical action. So the next thing you would like to do uh, normally with the quantum field theory is before you even quantize, uh, so with the field theory in general, is you want to find out what the ground states are, what the vacuum of these theories are. And this will lead me to the phases of the GLSN. So I'm, I'm really inconsistent with my labeling, but let me call this part two, phases of a GLSN. So basically, the idea will be that we will have a very complicated uh, potential, and we want to find the zeros of the potential. And the series of the potential will, in the end, have some kind of geometry. So you will have a vacuum manifold. And the GLSMs that I'm going to talk about for the rest of these lectures will be engineered in such a way that the vacuum manifold is Calabial. So this is the basic idea on my view of GLSMs, construct a Calabiao space as a vacuum of a quantum field theory. So um, because this will be a little bit technical and somewhat complicated and very mathematical, and because I'm given six hours instead of four hours, um, let me start off um, with, with a toy example uh, and then go to the most more complicated case. So, um, so what we want to do is find 
the vacua, or let's say the classical vacua. So quantum effects will come tomorrow. Uh, today we're all classical physics of the GLSN. So um, before doing that, and before, so that will basically be find the zeros of the scalar potential. In general, the minimum of the potential, but we will tune it such like that, and it will be the zeros. Uh, but before we do that, um, I find it somewhat instructive to give a very simple example that, in particular, people who study the standard model should recognize very well. So let's start off with um, first a toy model. And then we'll come back to the more complicated things and uh, hopefully they will make a little bit more sense. So in the toy model will actually be the Higgs potential. So uh, what do we do? Um, at first we have to specify our field content. So we'll have to specify V and the coordinates of V as I did before. So we will have a complex scalar field. So if I'm and I call it phi of x, let's assume we have just one of them, uh, but there could be more, and there will be more later on. So a scalar field in a more mathematical language is a map uh, from some manifold, uh, which I call space-time, because it's complex into the complex number. That's what the complex scalar field is. Um, and in the case of the GLSM, the manifold would just be the Riemann surface sigma. Uh, but in this case, um, it can be four-dimensional Minkowski space, whatever you like. So in principle, I could take this complex scalar field and, and couple it to other fields like a gauge field uh, or, uh, or matter fields, which I then would call quarks and something like that, very similar to the GLSM. Um, and I can do this. Uh, but when I'm just interested in the vacua, um, the vacua of the theory will be fully specified by the scalar fields. So I will write down a scalar potential that captures the self-interaction of the scalar field. And that's going to be the Higgs potential. So this is a vertical line. So this is it's a complex field. So this means modulus squared. And then I introduce a parameter, which I call V squared. And then I take a square. Um, so in principle, there can be more interaction terms, just uh, other than the scalar inter the, the interaction terms of the scalar fields. Um, but um, when you just look at the vacuum of the theory, the other fields like the fermions or the gauge fields, they will be zero in the vacuum. So the, the, the true vacuum is really just by Lorentz invariance, actually. And I'm always looking at Lorentz invariance symmetry that the vacuum geometry is given by the zero of the potential that only captures the scalar fields and the vector fields and the fermions, they will be zero in the vacuum. So that's why this is enough to specify this. So um, we've probably seen this potential before, and I should apologize for my drawing skills. Um, but we have phi and we have u of phi, and you should view this in, let's say, 3D if you want. Um, and um, this is this typical potential here, and you should rotate that. And you can see from the pictures already um, what the zeros are going to be. So I'm already putting in this circle here, and the circle will be relevant. So this is this is uh, what governs the Higgs effect as well. And the phi, the v for now, so this would be minus v and v, then you have to rotate it. Uh, this, is, this is a parameter. And I would like you to make the connection to these fi parameters um, that I've um, discussed before, even though it's like not one to one, but it's instructive. And I will also assume uh, that there is a symmetry acting on it. Uh, so I'm not necessarily saying it is a gauge symmetry. Um, it can be, at this point, a global and a local symmetry. So at this point, 
um, in this for this toy model, it can be global or local, but it will be as it will be make a dip, big difference in the end whether what it is. So this is the minimum amount of data I want to specify. Um, so now we want to find this classical vacuum. So um, classical vacuum. We want to find the minima of this U of V. Um, and in this case, it will be the zeros. So that's very easy to see what that is. So it actually tells us that the modulus of phi has to be V. And I didn't really specify uh, what um, values V is allowed to take, but just from this equation, we see that it makes sense that it should be um, a positive or zero integer, uh, a real number, but it shouldn't be negative. So, of course, in physics, we call this a vacuum expectation value. And you see, it only fixes the modulus of a complex number, but it leaves the phase free. So actually, the vacuum expectation value of V, which I use this angle standard angle bracket notation, is going to be V is e to the i phi, where phi well can depend on space time, and it can take values 0 and 2 pi. So we have a phase. Uh, and that actually tells us that, as it's up there in the picture, that the vacuum of this theory is a circle. And, and that's kind of important uh, also for the context of the GLSM, because what we have done is we have taken a physical theory, we've looked at the vacuum, which is given by the zeros of the scalar interaction terms, and we have constructed a circle. So we have discovered a geometry. So uh, basically, if we lived in a world where everybody knows quantum field theory and nobody knows circles, you could discover a circle by computing the minimum uh, or the vacuum of a certain quantum field theory. And this might sound a bit overkill because there are many, many other ways of um, computing a circle. But this is how we are going to construct Calabias. So the point in the, of the GLSM will be that we can take much, we can specify theories with uh, much more complicated potential. Um, and we can uh, look at the vacua of this theory and we will get complicated manifolds and we'll get some more interesting things as well associated to this manifold. So I should make a few comments here. So I just computed the zeros of the potential and I found a circle. But you see here that this circle is given basically by a phase rotation. So this is the same thing as the action of the symmetry group that we have. So now it makes a really big difference if we have a global symmetry or a gauge symmetry. Because as you know, if you study the Higgs effect, each point of this circle will be gauge equivalent to each other point um, when this G equals U1 is a gauge symmetry. So actual, and, and that's called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that means that the actual vacuum is not a circle, but a point, because all the other points are gauge equivalent by gauge transformations. So um, if G is a gauge symmetry, the vacuum is a point because all the other points are gauge equivalent because uh, U1 action is just a phase rotation. Um, that's one comment. Um, so let's say this is comment one. And the comment two is um, that this parameter V um, is something like a modulus. So um, if we look at the um, at the theory, uh, we see that it should it should be a, a real positive number. Um, but we also see that if we look at the potential, uh, if v equals zero, then the shape of the potential will change. So it will no longer look like that, but it will look like something like that. And then you don't have like a circle of vacuo, but you also have a point. So the point I want to make here, I'm going to remove this again, is um, so the theory changes, or let's say the physics.
at v equals zero. So that's a rather drastic thing, having a point like vacuum versus having a circle shaped vacuum. Um, and, and this is also something that I want you to remember if I'm when I'm now going back to the GLSM uh, and write down the scalar potential for the GLSM and more or less repeat this discussion um, uh, in a more complicated context and with uh, the goal of constructing a vacuum that is not just a circle, but some more complicated manifold that I want to analyze further. But basically, this, this is the idea um, what, uh, what I'm going to do. So let's go back to the GLSM. Okay. Um, so um, what we want to do is we want to find uh, the ground states, so the zeros of the scalar potential. So if I had written down the full action in the beginning, we could just collect the terms which only collect, uh, contain interaction terms among the scalar fields. But I haven't written that down, so I just need to state it for you. Um, and I also call it U. And it will be quite a bit more complicated because we can have a lot more scalar fields and they are made to interact in a weird way um, using, uh, using super, uh, by means of supersymmetry. So again, the expression I write down has a lot of indices and traces and some suppressed, uh, and I will, they're, they're mostly for like understanding the structure. Um, and later in the examples, I will, I will spell that out. So what's the structure of this thing? So the first thing we notice is that now that we have our GLSM, we actually have two types of scalar fields. So we have the five fields from the chiral multiplet and the sigma fields from, uh, from the vector multiplet. And they can have self-interaction terms and they can interact amongst each other. So the first term will only depend on the sigma fields and it will actually not be there if we have an abelian gauge symmetry. So this term here, one over eight e squared is, uh, is just, um, just for completeness, it will not play a role in the later discussion. This E is another coupling constant I haven't introduced yet, and this is called the gauge coupling, or in more down-to-earth terms, the electric charge uh, or the gauge charge. So this is the gauge coupling. And then the point is that everything that I can write down is going to be a modulus squared. Um, so here we have sigma and sigma bar. Um, you, they are exp you expand them in terms of the Lie algebra generators, you compute the commutator, you trace over it, and you take the mod modulus squares of that, and I suppress all the indices in this context. So this is the sigma self-interactions. Um, and you immediately see if, this, if you have a group where the generators uh, commute, uh, then this term will not be there. Uh, and then you have mixed terms where the sigma fields interact uh, with the phi fields. So you have a one half and then a rather complicated term that I will need to explain a bit better, but let me write that down. So here what makes an appearance is the gauge charges that we have specified with this representation row at the beginning. And we have phi squared and then something that involves the conjugate fields squared so almost the same and i'll say more about this later and then terms i will specify further on that depend on the auxiliary fields um, d and f and i will just for now write that down like this uh, and the D and F will be specified in much more details later. So let me catch up a little bit on, on, on my notation here. So in particular, I've introduced angle brackets, and that should not mean vacuum expectation value. So these angle brackets here actually is just a scalar product um, on the Lie algebra. So we can take G star C, which is again the Lie algebra and not the group element, and complexify this. And um, map that into C. So the standard thing that pairs is lower group indices and upper group indices. So T sigma, for instance, so T is the Fi theta parameter, 
is basically sum over a equals one to rank g t a sigma a. So this is what the pairing means. And if you have more than one five fields, uh, you have to sum that up. And I will also show this in examples. So um, the, we will stare quite a bit at this thing because this is this is really depend, de determining uh, all our classical vacuum. The main takeaway message for now is that all of these expressions here are actually positive definites. They're all sums of squares. And I, so it, all of them are naturally complex. Uh, the D will turn out to be real. So, um, so this is really, um, this is um, this is really all sums of squares. So in order to get that to zero, each individual term has to vanish because each term is positive definite. Um, okay, so in order to get so, and, and I should also say if you have many many five sigma fields, you remember they have their matrix values, and if you have many many five fields, um, this is a very difficult equation to find the zeros for because it's highly nonlinear and it depends on many, many variables. So finding u equals zero itself um, is, um, is, is, is not an easy task um, because you're in a, in a, typically V is very high dimensional. So this, this, is, this is not easy to achieve. Okay, so what, what we will basically do is we will look at special cases first and then see how far we get. So to do this, um, I next want to, so D and F are auxiliary fields. So they mean, it means that they are in the action, they are non-dynamical, they don't have kinetic terms, so I can integrate them out by replacing them by their algebraic equations of motion. Um, and this is what I'm going to do, and these are typically called the D term and F term equations. So um, let me call the D term. And this is again very abstract and it will be more concrete in the examples. So D is given by something called the moment map minus theta. So let me just specify that mu of phi is given by a map from the vector space of scalar fields um, into the dual Lie algebra of the gauge group. And this is called the moment map, or sometimes called momentum map. And if you know the gauge charges uh, and your gauge symmetry, you can write that down immediately. Um, so for example, and we will see this again, if again, the gauge group is the simplest case, namely U1, so rank is one, um, the D term is given by uh, sum I equals one times dmv, which counts the scalar fields, take the corresponding cha gauge charges, take the modulus of the gauge fields squared, and then we only have one fi parameter, which it calls theta. And I should point that out. This, this is the parameter I specified before. This is the fi parameter. And you see that um, this is a real equation. So theta is, uh, is a real parameter. The q's are some integer numbers. Uh, they are they're the weights of the corresponding matter representation. And you have the modulus phi squared. So this, this is a real equation. And if you look back into the form of u, one of the equations we need to solve is d equals zero, because we need to solve each of these set to zero, each of these expressions uh, separately, because they are positive definite. Uh, and, and, and that's what we'll need to do, among other things, of course. Um, so these are the so-called d-term equations. And we'll need to solve d equals zero. Um, and I should also say, also in view of uh, other people uh, talking about GLSMs uh, in the future, like Rachel Webb from the mathematics perspective, um, in, uh, in, in mathematics, um, this um, theta also exists uh, and it's called, so this is in maths, it's related to what's called a stability parameter of a GIT quotient. 
if you talk to mathematicians, make sure that you say these words and maybe they will understand you. Um, okay, uh, so um, these are the D terms. The other thing I haven't specified is um, what happens when you integrate out this auxiliary field F. And this is only there when we have a superpotential. So um, since you have this background and the connection to topological field theories, um, the GLSM itself need not be a topological field theory. Um, and it's also not a conformal field theory. But uh, since you have 2,2 two supersymmetry, you can actually topologically twist the GLSM. Uh, and then you can make connections to topological field theories. And actually, a lot of the information that I will extract out of the GLSM will actually correspond to the topological sector of the, let's say, topological string theory that you, that you can naturally associate, for instance, to a Calabria. Okay, okay. so it's basically you need to still do a twisting. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. and I, I will not okay. need to make this explicit, but uh, a lot of the things I compute are things that you really see in a topological field theory, and there is a connection. Okay. And, and the topological twisting or the twisting works like the topological twist in a nonlinear sigma model because, because of the U1R symmetries, you have the U1 currents, and you basically can can twist with these U1 currents. But it's it's a bit more complicated because this is not a CFT. So like um you don't have like the technology of like various aura generators a priori. So this will happen in the low energy regime of the GLSM and then you can do all this. And, and this is also what I'm working towards. So what, what we will see is that uh, in the Calabiao case, the low energy effective theory of the GLSM can be a nonlinear sigma model, which we know relates to topological string theory. So at, at this level, it's sort of the GLSM in a certain way flows, if you want, to something that's a meaningful topological string theory. Okay, great. Okay, good. Yeah, please, please interrupt and ask. I... I love the fact that I have two OLs more than previously, so I can be a lot slower, which is much more relaxed. Um, all right. Um, so something that is sort of very topological in the sense that you have a holomorphic sector is actually the F-term equations. So the F-term equation just tells you compute the critical locus of the superpotential. So that just means compute the derivative of W with respect to the phi's. So maybe to avoid confusion, this is what I actually mean. So dw d phi i, and this f squared, because my lack of indices can be confusing, should be read as that. So we always always sum over all the fields. Um, so as I already said, but I want to state this uh, again, um, this scalar potential u, by sigma, which through the D term also depends on the FI parameter. So there is a free parameter in there. Uh, so I put that in there. Um, is a sum of squares. Or actually modular squares because we're over the complex numbers. Uh, so each summand. has to vanish individually. But in principle, we're doing the same thing as with the Higgs potential. It's just much more complicated. It's more terms. Um, and um, now I can come to, um, to try to solve this. Um, and Two things we will see explicitly is um, that uh, first, um, there will be different branches of solutions. And the second one is um, that the solutions through the D-term equation will depend on the FI parameter. 
So there is a moduli space of solutions parameterized by theta. And um, I should also note that we have a second parameter. I, I made a big fuss about the theta angle combining itself to a complex parameter t and so on and so forth. And to you know this in the classical analysis, which is what we're doing right now, which is finding the zeros of a potential um, of a classical field theory, um, theta does not appear. Um, but it will appear at the quantum level. And that's also very much the difference between the mathematics formulation of the GLSM and the physics formulation of the GLSM. In mathematics, you're basically at, in, in some way in the, at the classical level, uh, and the quantum effects uh, of, uh, that involve the theta angle um, are, are very hard to see, and you don't see it in the classical discussion. So this is more or less for the next lecture where we will have the theta angle. So bear with me and it will come back. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to take this very complicated expression and try to make a bit of a hierarchy of you know how you can solve this because you have two types of fields and so on and so forth. Um, and the first thing I want to look at is um, what's usually called the Higgs branch. And you should really see this in parallel to this toy example. And I, I'm a bit, I want to be a bit careful here. Um, and I just said that there are some caveats on what you call the Higgs branch for non-abelian GLSMs, where you can have something like strongly coupled phases and um, which makes it a bit more complicated. So depending on how much time I have, I will say more about that later. But for now, just let me state that for non-abelian GLSMs, it sometimes some people may be worried about calling something a Higgs branch. Um, all right, um, so this is one type of solutions that we have, uh, and it's actually a, sim a very simple thing. And so let me write it down and then scroll back up. Uh, it says that all of the sigma fields are zero. So this is this this really simplifies these things a lot because if you look at the first line of this potential up here, um, the sigma fields appear here and here and here. So if I set all of them to zero, all these things will be gone, uh, and all I need to worry is about so solving the determined F term equations. Let me remove the red lines again, and um, that means that as I just said, so I don't need to be red. Um, that u equals zero is given in terms of the solutions of the d term and f term equations. If you don't have a superpotential, it's just the d terms alone. So, um, and this solution depend on theta. So let's first do this formally to discuss a little bit the structure of the solution. And then in the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes, um, I will do the standard example and we will construct our first Calabria. So um, let me just... Uh, very formally solve the solutions because it gives way to certain mathematical structure. So the solution, so formally, and yeah, I should also say, yeah, let me write this a little more clearly. It depends. We depend on sigma. That means we can get different solutions to these equations depending on the value of sigma. And this will give the so-called phases of the GLSM that I mentioned at the beginning. So now we finally made it there. So how do we see this? So formally, very formally, we can write, okay, 
here's the D-term equation. Um, I haven't written it down in much detail, but I can just write down the formal solution by saying invert this mu, invert this equation. And that's basically what I write down. So we have a solution space, uh, which I will call X, and it will hopefully be a nice manifold, like the circle we had in the Higgs potential example. And it will what it is will depend on theta. And it's just like invert this equation, this moment map equation. And remember the fact that you have a gauge symmetry acting. So you see in the circle example, we found a circle, but then we had a gauge equivalent relation that actually told us that the circle is a point. Um, and something similar will happen here. Um, and that uh, you combine with the solution to the F-term equation, which is find the critical locus of uh, the holomorphic superpotential. So if we do that, I can just write formally. So that's just, this is just a mathematical way of saying um, solve dw equals zero. Um, and at this point, I want to rewrite this a bit, uh, which is maybe obvious to mathematicians, but not to me, but it will be obvious um, from, uh, from the way we treat these equations in an example. So we can also, alternatively write the first equation as follows. So we can take our vector space. So remember, this was the space the, uh, the chiral fields take values in. And what we will see is that this D-term equation will not always have a solution, uh, depending on what choice of parameters we have. So we will actually see that the solution will not be the full configuration space of the scalar fields, just like in the Higgs potential, in the end, we're reduced to a circle. Um, so we'll, we will see that we have to take out something uh, where the D-term equation does not have a solution, and we still um, have to act on something. We still have this gauge symmetry to quotient out by, but because V is now a complex space, we actually have to make sure that this acts on the complex space, and we'll call this a deleted set. Um, and we'll compute that explicitly in an example, and then you just if you have F terms, you add those. And I'm writing this down because uh, this is a way, this is something that mathematicians know and study very well. This is what's called a GIT quotient. So GIT stands for geometric invariant theory. And I'm, I'm certainly not the mathematician to really understand what that means, but it basically means constructing a manifold in this way, take some vector space, uh, remove something, have a gauge equivalence condition, and maybe intersect with, uh, with the hypersurface equation. And basically, having solutions depend on this parameter theta is what mathematicians are called variation of GIT quotients. And that's a big thing. And maybe in a few weeks, so whenever it takes place, Rachel Webb will do a much better job than I will to introduce into the mathematics uh, of a GIT quotient. All right, um, so these are the classical vacua on a certain branch of the theory, namely where we set all the sigma fields to zero. And in the next lecture, we'll come back and look at the other extreme uh, where we set all the five fields to zero. But for now, let's let's look at that. And I want to spend my rest of the, the rest of my time today to go hopefully somewhat slowly through the standard example, which is the construction of the quintic Calabiao and the so-called derivation of the lando ginzburg calabiao correspondence, which was, I think, one of the reasons why Witten actually introduced the gauge linear signal models. Okay, so let's do that. And because this is kind of big, let's make it a section of its own. Um, Quintic and what's called the lando ginzburg calabiao correspondence. So this is now one of the standard examples of Calabi-Yau GOSMs. And the goal will to be to give this field contents, the symmetries to specify all the data that I've given in the introduction, uh, to compute the vacua, and to appreciate that depending on the value of the FI parameter, the vacua of the theory will be vastly different. Um, and uh, that will also then play a very important role um, in these categorical equivalences that we will talk about in the third lecture. Okay, so 
let's go through the data that we've specified. So at first we need a gauge group and we'll take the simplest possible. So we'll take 2D electrodynamics, super symmetric. Um, the next thing we needed to specify was this complex vector space. And I will specify that in, in a more mathematical or in a more physical way. So, um, and this is actually, it's not only V, but it's also rho V. So let's write V and rho V, because we also see how the fields transform. But very often this is written as V is, well, all our fields are complex values, so they will take values in complex vector fields, and they will transform with certain gauge charges under the gauge symmetry. We only have a U1 symmetry, so we only have to specify the U1 charge of each field. Um, and very often this is sort of denoted in parentheses next to the complex vector space. And we will, the, the whole space that we have will actually be six dimensional. Um, so in other words, uh, the field content will be as follows. So instead of the Higgs example where we had one scalar fields, we now actually have six scalar fields, six complex scalar fields. And from the specification of the gauge charges that are already encoded above, we see that one of them is different than the five other ones. Um, and following Witten and the standard literature, we'll call the different one P, uh, and then very suggestively already the other ones just X1 to X5. And uh, we can be a little bit more specific about this. If you don't like this C of minus five, we can also um, look at the gauge charges like this. So I, I like to draw a table where I take um, the P field and the X1 to X5. And because it fits in, I also put in the fact that because we have a rank one gauge group, we only have one FI parameter and uh, we have the gauge symmetry. And for later reference, I will also put in the vector R symmetry because that was the third piece of data, that, or the fourth piece of data, that we also have the vector R symmetry and that we have to specify the R charges in a certain way. So um, what I what already this notation up here with the vector space means is that P will have gauge charge five. Uh, and the X fields will all have gauge charge one, and we have one FI parameter, which I call theta. And for now, I leave open uh, what the vector R charges will be. And um, let's just uh, note that the sum, so these are, these, these are the QIs. These are the weights of the U1 representation acting uh, on, uh, on the meta fields. Um, sum of I QI is, minus five plus um, sum i equals one to five, one, minus five plus five times one is zero. So this is the condition, the anomaly cancellation condition I met before. So this is a, we're having constructed a Calabi-Au geosan. So let's see in what sense it is calabi -Au. So the other thing I want to do, because I can, I don't have to, uh, but I can, is I want to specify a superpotential. It was this W of phi, remember? And I had two condition. Uh, one condition, two conditions. One condition was that it has R charge two, and the other condition was that it's gauge invariant. And uh, if we combine these two things, um, we can write down the most general expression that satisfies these two conditions. And in order to do that, because I have a superpotential, um, I will choose R charges like this, where we have a parameter kappa, which um, is for reasons that have to do with the fact that this theory is a conformal field theory in the infrared. So something that goes beyond the scope of the lectures will have to choose like that. So if you if you if you work that out, you will see that with this choice of this free parameter that I introduced into the U1, uh, you will see that all the fields have charges between zero and two. Um, all right. So we want to have the thing to have gauge charge zero and R charge two. 
Um, and my claim is that the most general thing you can write down is actually linear in the p fields, because for instance, when you set kappa equals to zero, that will give r charge two. Um, and that will have gauge charge minus five. So you need something which is a fifth power in the other axis to get something gauge invariant. And I will write this as g5 of the xi. So this is um, a degree five homogeneous polynomial in the xi. So it's an amusing exercise to find out uh, how many monomials this has, and the has, uh, and the answer should be 126, which is uh, something related to something interesting related to the Calabia. Um, and we will have to make some assumption, which will come in later. We will assume that this is this G5 is generic in a certain way. Uh, namely, that the only solution to the, the critical set of this equation, not the W itself, but the xi of these five equations, dg5 dxi, is all of them equals to zero. And this is a, this looks like a technical assumption, but when we look at the determinant f term equations, we will see that it is important. And in the end, when we discover the Calabiao vacuum that we're about to construct, we will actually see that this is related to the smoothness of the Calabiao that we construct. So instead of a circle, we'll have a Calabiao, and that needs to, we want it to be smooth. And um, so this is related to smoothness. And uh, you will see that you, you really want that for all these um, solutions to make to make proper sense. Um, all right, so if you want, you can stare at this a little longer and see that there are no other terms um, that you can write down such that R charge is two and you have gauge invariance. In particular, the R charge condition forbids things like P squared. Um, all right, um, so let's find the Higgs branches. So we have a sigma field here, but I'm not even writing that down. So all I'm writing down now is the explicit example of the D term and the F term equation, because we already know that all the rest of the scalar potential of this theory is not there if we set the sigma fields to zero. So this is sigma equals zero. And we have one sigma field because we always have as many sigma fields as the gauge group has rank. All right, so what are the two equations? One is the D term. And you only have one of them because there are as many d terms as the gauge group has rank. So we only have one of them. And this is minus five modulus p squared. I've written that down a bit more generally. So what you do is you take the gauge charge of the corresponding fields and multiply it with the modulus squared of the fields and then all add it up. And on the right hand side, you have the fi parameter. And this is what I'm doing. So the gauge charge of the xi's is one, so this is one times xi squared, and minus theta is equal to zero, so I bring theta to the other side. And the f terms, there are many, so um, you just take this and take the derivative with respect to all the fields, so you have to take the p derivative and the xi derivative. So from the p derivatives, you get the equation g5 of x is equal to zero. So you will have to set a, a homogeneous polynomial of degree five to zero, which um, if you know something about the quintic Calabiao, that should already ring a bell. But then you have all the other equations and this is P dg five dxi is equal to zero. And you see that this genericity condition will very much affect how you solve these equations. All right, um, so let's discuss the classical vacua. And we see immediately that here in the D term equation, the FI parameter appears. And the FI parameter is a real parameter. Um, so what we will have, we'll have to make a distinction as to whether Xi is larger than zero, Xi is smaller than zero, and the limiting case, which is Xi equals to zero, which we will, um, which we will discuss in much more detail tomorrow because, uh, or not tomorrow, the next lecture, because um, that, 
um, that will be uh, that will be subject to quantum corrections. So um, let's discuss the classical vacuum. So let's look at first at the case where this fi parameter is positive. So, so how do we read this d term equation? So you see here that um, we have modulo squares. Uh, so this of a complex number. So this will always be positive. Uh, and the right hand side will be positive too. But the coefficient uh, of the p squared term will be negative. So if I were to set all the x's to zero, then I would not be able to solve this equation because the right-hand side is positive and the left-hand side is negative. So you will not be able to find a solution. So, and that brings me back to this deleted set that I have introduced before. So um, we see that um, x1 equals all the way up to x5 equals zero is not an allowed solution. So that means this deleted set f theta larger than zero um, is x1 equals x5 equals zero. And this is pretty much the only message that we can get out of this t-term equation is that when theta is larger than zero, I'm not allowed to set all the x's to zero. And that's important information. And, and that's that's the sensitivity to this to this parameter, and that will lead to all the phases. And that's sort of a bit equivalent to the fact that uh, this in the toy example with the circle, the v has to be a positive uh, number for for the vacuum equations to make sense. Um, and um, the rest is basically to look at the f term equations. So let's let's do a little bit of counting. So the f term equations are six six equations for six variables, and we have a, a scaling condition on the variables coming from the U1 symmetry. So in general, the only solution to this system will be all the x's equal zero and the p-field equal zero, because we have um, yeah six variables and six equations. Uh, you cannot really expect to solve them all the time. However, um, we already know that we have to exclude all the x's equal zero as a solution. And we also have made this genericity assumption that the solutions, which are like five of the five of the f-term equations, only have a solution x equals zero, which sort of ties in by construction basically into um, uh, into how we want to solve these equations. So the whole upshot if, uh, of this is when you take into account the solution to the d-term equation and the fact that you have a restriction on your structure of your G5 is the only way to solve the f-term equation is basically uh, that avoids xi equals zero is to set the p-field to zero. So um, that means that, um, so genericity, implies that in order to get a vacuum, you have to set p equals to zero. And that kills those five equations. And the only constraint that we're left is this chief, uh, is, is the condition to set this g5 to zero. So uh, let's do this. So let's collect all the data. This is pretty much all we have to do at this point that we can extract out of these equations. So Let's discuss what our vacuum manifold is. So this is x for the region in the fi parameter space where the fi parameter is positive. So we can write this as follows. So remember that the x's uh, are complex variables. So we have we start off with a five-dimensional complex space, and the p-field is gone. So uh, we we no longer see the the, the, the vector space. Um, contribution of the p-field. So instead of the vector space I specified before, we just have five copies of complex space, uh, which are uh, in which the, val the fields x1 to x5 takes values in. But because we are in this particular phase, we have to exclude the point. We have to exclude one point, the origin of this five-dimensional complex space. And then, Coming back uh, to the Higgs example, we now have like a five-dimensional uh, manifold and we have extracted a point, uh, but we also have this 
gauge symmetry is still acting and that whenever we have we make a gauge transformation on the axis um, you will get an equivalent configuration and you have to reduce the physical vacuum by the gauge equivalent states so this is also what we did in the in the Higgs example we started off with the circle but when the u1 was a gauge symmetry we could what's usually called uh, a unitary gauge and uh, the, the true vacuum is a point so we do the same thing here. We have to mod out by gauge equivalence relation of the axis. Um, so we just write this by xi is equivalent to lambda to the power one. These are the gauge charges xi, where this lambda is a u1 element. Um, and that, that's, that's the formal solution of the d term equations. And it has the structure. So this is really v minus f theta modded out by GC. This is exactly the structure that we had before. Um, and then we have to intersect that uh, with the F term equations that are left. And this is G5 of X is equal to zero. So um, let me remove this uh, again, because this is already something that we had above. So if you know a bit of algebraic geometry, um, or just very elementary, if you take a complex space, take out the origin and mod out by an equivalent relation, this is one way to define a projective space. So what the solution to the D-term equation actually gives you is that the configuration space uh, of the scalar fields in the vacuum is actually not um, the full space we had before, a complex space, but only a weighted project, but only a projective space, CP4. And that what I've written down is just one way to define complex projective space as something that's called a symplectic quotient um, or a GAT quotient. And um, this uh, this in, in, in the in the Higgs example, this is what replaces the circle. Um, but now we have more. We also have this g5 equals to zero. So we also have uh, one constraint inside this complex projective space. So what we're doing is we're sweeping out a hypersurface of a certain degree, namely degree five in complex, in four dimensional complex projective space. So let me write this as theta larger than zero is projective coordinates x1 to x5 in CP4 such that, and now I have to make this a bit bigger, g5 of x is equal to zero. And this is what's typically known as the quintic in p4. People usually drop the c in front of the p4 from the hypersurface equation because everything's complex anyway, and this is, uh, this is, um, this is in, uh, this is, uh, in uh, implicit. And this is something complex three-dimensional because you have one hypersurface equation given by GZ, one, one condition in a four, one complex equation in a four-dimensional complex space. Um, and it turns out that this is a Calabia threefold. And if you worked on string compactifications in the past, you'll probably have come past the Quintic Calabia. It's one of the most famous prototypical examples. This is the Calabia threefold, which is known as the Quintic. So that's all nice and well. Um, I have some minutes left. Uh, so let me point out that this is not really the whole story in view of the GLSM. So before I, I said that, I, I, I want to come back to Daniel's previous question. So I've only computed the vacuum so far. But when we have a, when we have a classical field theory, what we typically do is we sort of compute the low energy effective theory around this vacuum. We take the vacuum expectation values of the fields and turn on small fluctuations, reinsert that into the action and get the effective theory at a the classical level. So if you were to do that, and that's highly non-obvious uh, how to do this, is if you did this full, full analysis, what you would find is that the low energy effective theory in the theta larger than zero phase 
is a well, I, I suppressed all the supersymmetry, but of course, uh, when you go away from the vacuum, you have to turn back on all, all the fermions and everything that's that's there, is a 2,2 supersymmetric non-linear sigma model. with target space x theta. So uh, I don't want to go too too much into detail with that, but nonlinear sigma models are basically maps from a world sheet into some target space. And uh, this is the connection also to the topological string. So this nonlinear sigma model happens to be a conformal field theory. So this is a CFT. And it basically is the CFT that describes the Calabia. Uh, and you can topologically twist that because it's a CFT, everything you know about topological twists and you know shifting the energy momentum tensor with the U1 current and so on and so forth. All of this works out. So as you go to the low energies um, in, in the GLSM, you recover um, the standard things that people use in, in topological string theory and mirror symmetry but it, it only appears as a low energy configuration uh, of the GLSM. So in my last few minutes, um, I want to point out that there is more to this because from the GLSM perspective, nobody tells us that this FI parameter has to be positive. It's, it, 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 it is some real parameter. So we can ask the question is, what happens to the theory if we make theta negative? Because the GLSM certainly allows for that. So this is the last thing I'm going to do today. It looks like looking at the time. So let's compute the other case, which is theta less than zero. So let's go back and find our D term and F term equation. So now the right-hand side is negative definite. And in contrast uh, to the other discussion, we are now more than safe to set all the x's to zero. Um, but we had better not set the p-field to zero because we need something negative also on the left-hand side of the equation for this to have a solution. So what drastically changes is the deleted set and therefore also the low energy configurations of the theory. So we see that uh, p equals zero is not allowed. So we have that deleted set as I had it in the general solution is just p equals zero. And if you move on through the D terms in F, so, so now if you look at the F terms, suddenly you cannot set the P to zero. So you're basically forced to set all the X's to zero, otherwise you won't find a solution. And indeed that is the case. Um, so the vacuum is given by X1 equals X5 equals equals zero. So this again follows from the genericity condition and the F term equations. So we have something that very much looks like this Higgs vacuum we had in the toy example, because we have that the modulus of P, so if you look back at the D term equation, um, if the X's are zero, you can really solve this equation literally and you get the solution for the modulus of P. And the modulus of P is square root of minus theta to the five. And my, minus theta is then positive because theta is negative. So we, we don't get complex numbers or anything, anything scary. So this is exactly what we had uh, with the Higgs story, almost exactly, because um, that means that uh, P itself is a circle um, because we can put on a phase. And uh, because U1 is a gauge theory, uh, the U1 action just is a phase action. So modding out the gauge equivalent terms actually means that the vacuum is not a circle as specified by the equation that's here, but it's a point. So um, choosing, you can fix the gauge to set the phase. Well, it's, it's like, it's not the phase of the shield assembly, it's a bit annoying, but to set um, the, the, let's say, the, the arguments of P to zero, remember it's a complex number, so that makes sense, um, 
so that we have the vacuum is given by x equals zero and p obtaining a vacuum expectation value minus c double five. So it would be a complex number, but I can use the gauge symmetry to, to make it a, a, turn it into a point and a real number. It's called unitary gauge, same as in the Higgs effect. So that means that the vacuum appears to be a point. So, so, so this is not, not, a man, not a manifold in the richness of a Calabial. So it's not obvious that this has anything to do with Calabial's. Um, so it's, 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 it's a little bit more complicated. And in order to see the full structure, we cannot stop there. Uh, but we have to do the same thing that we also would need to do to recover this nonlinear sigma model. So what we have to do is we have this vacuum, which is just given by x equals zero and p taking this vacuum expectation value. And then we turn on small classical fluctuations of the X fields, reinsert that into the action and look at the low energy effective theory. And when we do this, uh, we get something else. And let me just state that and then I think we're done for today. Um, so one comment that we have to have is, so I use the U1 symmetry to gauge fix P to have like a real value. But the difference between this example and the Higgs example is that um, we still have a residual gauge symmetry left. So since P transforms with gauge charge five, um, there is a residual gauge symmetry. which is a set five subgroup, because if you, if, if lambda is an element of set five, uh, this will be invariant. So P is invariant under this subgroup of U1, and that's our spontaneous symmetry breaking happening here. Um, so what we can then do, as I said, is, is turn on classical fluctuations. of everything, in particular of the XI and all the other fields. Not the sigma fields because they are gauge fields and they only have a discrete gauge symmetry left, so you don't really have a vector potential and everything. Um, and note that this set five symmetry um, will act non-trivially on the axis. And what we have as the low energy effective theory is not a nonlinear sigma model with a target space a point. That would be much less, but it's actually a rather rich theory. And I can write this as x theta less than zero is um, the space of the classical fluctuations of the axis. So again, a C5. But now having this set five residual gauge symmetry in there, so it's not a projective space, it's something that's called an, an orbifold or a stack, if you're mathematically inclined. I recently learned that this is actually called a Deline Munford stack, um, but we don't need to go there. Uh, and then because you have turned on fluctuations of the axis, um, uh, what did I write before? And all other fields. Yes. Uh, so that's, sorry. So you take, you also, well, not all the other fields, but um, <clears throat> like, uh, like the fermions, for instance. Fermions are secretly there, but set to zero, but not the gauge fields, because we don't have a, like a continuous gauge symmetry left. So what we have is, this ambient space instead, uh, sorry, can you just speak up, Jay, because I, I may not, uh, so what I did right before that, yeah, it acts, actually, sorry, it acts non-trivially on the axis, sorry for my handwriting. No, the upper line. Upper line. Uh, turn on classical fluctuations of the XI and the other, and other fields. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so, sorry about that. I'm running out of time, so my handwriting gets even worse. Um, so this is really something standard in field theory. You, you take the vacuum, 
and you fix the fields to, to the vacuum expectation value and then turn on small fluctuations, reinsert it in the reaction and see what you get. And this is what you call the classical effective action. Um, and what you get here is this sort of space and plus a superpotential. And the superpotential is given by the P fixed to its VF. And if you turn on the fluctuations of the Xi, you rediscover that they lived on a, on a quintic potential. And this is called a Landau-Ginzburg orbifold. And uh, this is a 2,2 supersymmetric theory, which is not a conformal field theory, but is believed to flow under renormalization group flow to a conformal field theory. And what we will see in the later discussion is that this lander ginzburg model has, at least in the topological sector and also in others as well, encodes, despite being so different, the same information as the quintic. And this is called the lander ginzburg calabiar correspondence. So this is the lander ginzburg calabiar correspondence. This is a good point to stop. So just to give you a teaser of what will come in the next lecture, we, we have a moduli space now. So which is spanned by the Fi parameter, but also in principle, the theta angle, which we haven't really seen yet. Um, so, so far, what we have, so when the F theta angle being two pi periodic makes a moduli space basically into a cylinder. So we know that with theta less than zero, we get a lander ginzburg orbifold. And with theta larger than zero, we get this Calabi-Yau nonlinear sigma model as a low energy effective theory. Um, and what I missed so far is what happens in the middle. And so the thing is, there is a suspicion because two theory appear as phases of the same physical theory that there must be somehow a correspondence. So a question we can ask is, can you take physical objects like quantum states or D brains and move it to the other model and see what happens there through the GLSM? But for that, we need to know what happens in the middle. And this is what I'm going to discuss in the next lecture, maybe also along with a few more complicated examples of a non-abelian GLSM to make a bit more connection to not so classic and new research projects. All right, that's it. Any questions?